Good morning and welcome to live stream worship again. I'm David Hall. I'm one of the pastors here at Christ Church. We have some, I think, good news for you today with our live stream software. We bought some new software this week and installed it. It's called We See You, and it allows us to see right into your living room or wherever you are worshiping right now. Some of you may need to run and put some more clothes on because next week we're going to be showing a collage, a video of all of you worshiping and you just may be a star. And I may just be kidding about all of this, okay? Last Sunday, we asked you to download our new church app if you haven't done that yet. And in two days, 200 more people downloaded the app. And all week, we've been hearing compliments about how that app helps us to stay connected with each other. This pandemic is causing us really to rethink church and to make some new plans for things that have changed Christina and the worship teams have already put together plans for some awesome live stream worship services for Palm Sunday, Holy Week, and Easter. You can already see details about some of that 
online. You can, we'll be hearing more about it on Facebook and on the New Church app. Now is the time for the church to really step up in a new way to reach out to others. And we've just completed a beautiful email piece that's going to be going out in just another week to 50,000 people in the area surrounding Christ Church. It invites them to worship with us every Sunday online and also especially during these special services of Holy Week. It tells about my Facebook Live Bible study on Wednesdays at noon. By the way, we'll be in 1 Corinthians chapter 5 through 8 this week. It tells about WOW on Wednesday. It tells about Mom to Mom and a new children's moment that's happening, both of those on Thursday. There are lots of those things. They're all available either live, live streamed, or on our website and church app. All of these are being done to help us stay connected with one another and with our community. I would ask you, please think about someone you know who is not in any church and invite them to worship with us on Sunday online and also send links to them to these special studies and events to help them feel connected. In other words, share your faith and be inviting. Thank you.
be our vision through this time. Church family, we miss having you in this place with us, but we know that you are here with us from your living room, from your bedroom, from your car, wherever you are right now this Sunday. It's such a blessing that we get to come together and worship. And the song we're going to do next, if you would like to type in Waymaker dash lyrics, you can bring up the words on your phone or your computer to sing with us if you have another device in the room. This song has ministered so much to all of us this week. It talks about a God who can make a way where we don't see a way. And it talks about his presence moving in this place, but his presence is moving in your living room. His presence is with you in your car. Wherever we come together to worship him is a sanctuary and God's presence is there. It's holy ground. So this morning, sing this song with us, worship with us. There's one line that says, even when I don't see it, you're working. And those of you that know me, I am smiles and happy and at peace filled most of the time. And I've had some days this week where anxiety has gotten the best of me. And then I've had days where I start the day right in God's presence, turn the news off a little while and just worship him. So I encourage you today to sing the words of the song, make this your prayer. Know that he is with us in this storm, even when we don't see the answer right now. So let's worship together.
I don't see it, you're working. Even when I don't feel it, you're working. You never stop, you never stop working. You never stop, you never stop working. Even when I don't see it, you're working. Even when I don't feel it, you're working. You never stop, you never stop working. You never stop, you never stop working. Even when I don't see it, you're working. Even when I don't feel it, you're working. You never stop, you never stop working. You never stop, you never stop working. Let's continue in our worship as we go to God in prayer. Would you bow with me? Almighty God, things happen to us sometimes that just absolutely rock our world. Whenever that happens, we lean on you, but we want whatever it is, whatever has happened, to just be over and done. As this pandemic continues to spread, as more testing produces more positive results, we want this to be over and done. But we try to listen to health officials who tell us that this could be here for a while. And so we ask you for patience. We ask you as a church to help us to find new ways. Give us wisdom to be your church in new ways, to reach out, to make disciples, to serve, to help others to find a relationship with you. Help us to use this time, perhaps more time than we've had before, to dig more deeply into your word to pray to you, to listen to you, that we might open our hearts and have our faith strengthened. We pray your guidance on all that we do in our families. Help us, help us, Almighty God, give us strength in these days. We give you thanks for some good news we're seeing from China, where we hear that the rate of new cases is less than the rate of those who are recovering and an image on TV this week of some hospitals starting to close. May that trend continue and go to Italy so desperately in need of your healing touch and to other parts of Europe and then to our own shores. Bless us, Heavenly Father. We ask that you be with persons among us in our congregation who have lost loved ones, some even this week. Touch them and help them in their mourning. Be with those who are facing surgeries and other illnesses Extend your healing touch. For all who provide health care here and around the world, be with them in a special way. Bless them and keep them healthy. We thank you for the message you have placed on Pastor Nathan's heart this morning and ask that you anoint him as he comes to preach your word for us, your church. And now we pray together our Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen.
I am continuing today in this sermon series that we started several weeks ago, Walking Where Jesus Walks. We're reflecting back on stories in the Gospels that tell about where Jesus walked long ago when he was here on earth and being reminded that he still walks in those places and situations and invites all those who would follow him to do the same. We're focused in the Gospel of Matthew this year, so our text for today is Matthew chapter 14, I'll begin reading at verse 1. At that time, Herod the Tetrarch heard the reports about Jesus, and he said to his attendants, This is John the Baptist. He has risen from the dead. This is why miraculous powers are at work in him. Now, Herod had arrested John and bound him and put him in prison because of Herodias, his brother Philip's wife. For John had been saying to him, it is not lawful for you to have her. Herod wanted to kill John, but he was afraid of the people because they considered John a prophet. On Herod's birthday, the daughter of Herodias danced for the guest and pleased Herod so much that he promised with an oath to give her whatever she asked. Prompted by her mother, she said, give me here on a platter the head of John the Baptist. The king was distressed, but because of his oaths and his dinner guests, he ordered that her request be granted and had John beheaded in the prison. His head was brought in on a platter and given to the girl who carried it to her mother. John's disciples came and took his body and buried it. Then they went and told Jesus. When Jesus heard what had happened, he withdrew by boat privately to a solitary place. Hearing of this, the crowds followed him on foot from the towns. When Jesus landed and saw a large crowd, he had compassion on them and healed their sick. We thank God for the reading and hearing of his twice-inspired word, inspired when it was written, and I believe still inspired today as we allow it to inspire us and guide us and teach us what it means to be the people of God. Well, I have to say I am amazed by this story. I'm amazed by Jesus' decision to walk away, to not respond or react as most people would to this kind of situation. It all begins with the intrigue around John the Baptist and what happened to him. If this was a modern-day movie, it would easily receive an R rating. John's very existence becomes a game being played out in the halls of royalty. He's been speaking out against Herod the Tetrarch. Uh, Tetrarch was, uh, this, this was not King Herod. This, uh, King Herod was the one who was ruling back at the time, around the time that Jesus was born. This is one of his sons. And a, a Tetrarch was one who uh, ruled over a certain portion of the kingdom. Uh, Herod has had John in prison. He's, uh, Herod, this Herod had married his half-brother, Philip's, ex-wife, Herodias. And John had been speaking out against that. 
telling everybody how unlawful it was. So Herod puts him in prison to shut him up, or at least get him out of the ear of the public. He wanted to have him killed, but he realized he was very popular with the people, so he wouldn't dare do that. His, his wife, Herodias, hated John. It was obvious she would do anything to get him, even to the point of using her own daughter to seduce him into making this pledge to give her anything she wanted. And when he made the pledge, her daughter checked in with mom, and mom knew exactly what she t- wanted to tell her. I want John's head on a platter. And it says the king was distressed about that. He and yet I wonder, it tells earlier in the story that he wanted to kill him, so you have to, you have to wonder if, if part of him wasn't kind of happy about this. At least I'm getting rid of this troublesome preacher. But what amazes me most about the story is what happens next. After John's disciples bury his body, they go to tell Jesus what happened. Again, if this was a movie, you could, you could imagine the music changing as they're approaching Jesus, you could imagine it being kind of an ominous tone in the music because everybody's got to expect that Jesus is going to do something to seek some kind of revenge on what's happened here. The next verse probably stops the music altogether. When Jesus heard what had happened, he withdrew by boat privately to a solitary place. Now, I can imagine what some other people were thinking, if not saying, around Jesus. Jesus, where are you going? What are you doing? This was John they're talking about. This is a member of your family. Where, what are you doing? Did you hear what they did to him? Surely you're going to do something about this. I tell you what I'd do if it was me. If I was in your shoes, I'd spend every waking hour for the rest of my life making sure that a similar, if not the same thing, happened to Herod and maybe Herodias and maybe even her daughter as well. Off with their heads. When Jesus heard what had happened, he withdrew. I have to wonder what effect him walking away had on his disciples. I even wonder particularly what effect this had on Judas. Was this the point? There was something that happened before they got to Jerusalem that caused Judas to begin to doubt Jesus, to to realize for Judas that Jesus wasn't his Lord. I wonder if it started here. I don't know, but I wonder. When I think about it more, I really shouldn't be surprised by what Jesus did. After all, this is what he taught. This is the way he lived. Earlier in this same Gospel of Matthew, we read about him teaching that getting back at someone who does you wrong is not his way. In chapter 5, at verse 38, he said, You have heard it said, eye for eye and tooth for tooth. But I tell you, do not resist an evil person. And after he gives a few examples of what that looks like, he follows up with this. You have heard that it was said, love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I tell you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you, that you may be children of your Father in heaven. He ends that section by letting us know this kind of love is the height of what it means to be the people of God. Be perfect, therefore, he says, as your heavenly Father is perfect. This perfection that he's talking about is perfection in loving other people, even including enemies. Not only did Jesus teach this throughout his ministry, both with his words and his actions, he did so after his death on the cross. I mean, think about it. After he was resurrected from the tomb, that was a primary opportunity to get revenge on those who had brought about his death. The chief priest and all those other religious leaders who participated in that mockery of a trial, uh, the, all the people in the crowd who had hollered, crucify him, Pontius Pilate, the soldiers who had mocked him and, 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 and kind of had fun with him and, and spit in his face and put that crown of thorns down over his head and those who had driven the nails into his hands and his feet and even his disciples, maybe especially his disciples, those closest to him who had scattered when he needed them most. 
It's a storyline of a lot of our movies today, is it not? I mean, that person who's been done wrong, that, that maybe has been defeated or even died, and somehow they come back, and then they get revenge on everybody who's had anything to do against them. And we cheer that. We love that. Not so with Jesus. The most powerful person who ever lived on this earth chose to walk away from that common path of this world. He met with his disciples several times at that point, forgiving them and restoring them and reminding them of the mission that he had been preparing preparing them for all along. Now, let's be reminded that this is not just a teaching of Jesus. This, is, this was back in the Old Testament. This is later in the New Testament, throughout the Bible. Back in the Old Testament, one of my favorite stories there is the story of Joseph when he encountered his brothers. He was the second most powerful man in Egypt. And you'll remember, some of you will remember that much earlier in his life, his brothers had thrown him in the well. I don't know how long he was in there, but an hour is too long. And, and then they sold him to the slave traders. Can you imagine the rage that welled up in him on that trip to Egypt? And then while he was in jail, but now he's the second most powerful man in Egypt and his brothers are before him. They don't recognize him yet. Everybody would have understood if he had gotten some level of revenge on them. He could have had them thrown in prison. He could have probably found an individual well for each of them. He could have made slaves out of each of them. But he chose to walk away from that temptation. He forgave them. He reconciled with them and his relationships with all of his family. But there's another story before that story. Another incident in this same family that happened a generation before this. And I wonder if this earlier story had an effect on Joseph here. Joseph's father was Jacob, and Jacob had a twin brother named Esau. Uh, Jacob had done Esau wrong. He had tricked Esau out of his birthright, and he had tricked their father into blessing him rather than Esau. It was supposed to go to Esau. It had made Esau so mad that he threatened to kill his own brother, and, and Jacob had to run away. But then years later, God led Jacob to go back to his homeland and face his brother. And as that, that meeting drew close, it was apparent that Esau was going to seek some revenge. And yet when they met, he hugged him, he embraced him, he forgave him, and, and they were reconciled. Joseph was there when that happened. I don't know how old he was. He was a child. I don't but, but he was there. And I imagine Jacob talked about that meeting for some time, for years later. I wonder if that family story, that family scene, influenced Joseph as he faced his brothers. Did Uncle Esau's act of reconciliation have an impact on what happened a generation later? It reminds us all that we have an impact on those around us, both good and bad, that, that we can influence others around us. And sometimes that impact, that influence, continues for years later, even into the next and into future generations. What impact are you having on those around you? What example are you setting for those around you? Well, then later over in the New Testament, the Apostle Paul, in his letter to the church at Rome, focuses on this same issue at one point. In chapter 12, at verse 17, he writes, Do not repay evil for evil. Do not repay anyone evil for evil. Just two verses later, he comes back to it. Do not take revenge, my dear friends, but leave room for God's wrath, for it is written, it is mine to avenge, I will repay, says the Lord. On the contrary, if your enemy is hungry, feed him. And if he's thirsty, give him something to drink. And then in verse 21, just a little bit later, 
do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. I saw a movie clip earlier this week that fits so well with what Jesus is teaching us in this passage. It comes from the movie, The Interpreter. I'd never seen the movie before. When I saw the clip, I went and found the movie. I watched the movie. Nicole Kidman and Sean Penn are the uh, leading characters. Nicole is a interpreter at the United Nations. She had grown up in Africa and had seen atrocities there, even uh, those done to her own family. Well, Sean Penn is a federal agent who's investigating. Uh, she has heard, overheard uh, from some others kind of accidentally that there's going to be an assassination attempt on an African leader who's coming to give a speech at the UN. Sean asks her, his character asks her, about what had happened to her related to this same leader earlier in her life, to her family. And I'm intrigued by what she tells here, especially about a ritual, an African ritual. And let's listen in. What are you not telling me? What are you accusing me of? How do you feel about Zawani? Never mind, I don't care for him. I feel disappointment. That's a lover's word. What about rage? Of all the people that I've looked into since this thing started, the one with the darkest Zawani history is you. It was his landmines that killed you. Shh. We don't name the dead. Everyone who loses somebody wants revenge on someone on God if they can't find anyone else. But in Africa, in Machopo, the coup believe that the only way to end grief is to save a life. If someone is murdered, a year of mourning ends with a ritual that we call the drowning man trial. There's an all-night party beside a river at dawn. The killer is put in a boat, he's taken out on the water, and he's dropped. He's bound so that he can't swim. The family of the dead then has to make a choice. They can let him drown or they can swim out and save him. The coup believe that if the family lets the killer drown, they'll have justice but spend the rest of their lives in mourning. But if they save him, if they admit that life isn't always just, that very act can take away their sorrow. Vengeance is a lazy form of grief. There are a lot of people in this world, including Christians, who live by an eye for an eye, a tooth for a tooth. You get me, I'm going to get you. And they call it justice. And it may be justice. Just know that it's not Christian. It is not the way of Christ. He called us to something higher, something better, something beyond that. And it's not just that Jesus refrained from responding as the world would teach us to respond. It's what he did right after this that's so amazing. I might even call it amazing grace. After we're told what Jesus, that Jesus withdrew to seek some privacy, Matthew tells us that the crowds followed him to where he landed. Think about his situation at that point. He's had a tragedy in his family. And he sought some privacy to deal with that, but a crowd of people showed up. What would you do? I can imagine that I would at least send a disciple out to the crowd and say, folks, I appreciate you, you love Jesus and you want to be with him, but he just needs some time right now, and, and we just ask that you leave. And, and we'll get a message out. We'll send it out to all the networks and on social media. We'll get a message out to you, but right now we just need you to leave. Jesus didn't ask him to leave. Matthew writes that when he saw them, he had compassion on them and healed the sick among them. In other words, he kept doing what Jesus always did. 
If you stay with the story, it gets even more amazing. Many of you have heard the story of when Jesus uh, fed the 5,000, actually it was way more than 5,000, with five loaves of bread and two fish. Well, according to Matthew, it's at this point that that miracle happened. It was later in that evening, that same day, the same day that he found out about what happened to his family member, the same day that he fed all these people and he healed their sick. In other words, Jesus' response to the craziness, the sinfulness of this world, even when as a human it hit close to home, it became personal. His response was to continue doing what he always did, serving the needs of others and helping them experience the presence of God. He simply continued his mission. He simply continued being who he was. He didn't respond as the world would have responded. We live in such a reactionary time. Anytime someone does or says something with which we disagree or uh, something that hurts us in any way, many people feel they need to respond, usually in anger, if not in some revengeful way. Sometimes that's with words, something said or written or posted, and we feel like we have to respond to it. Sometimes it even reaches a level of violence. Well, that can apply to most any place in our lives, to most any relationship in our lives, any encounter with other people in our lives. One of the places where I believe our Lord calls us to walk away these days is on social media. And with the fact that we're having much more time to be on social media these days, maybe it's even more necessary to hear this. Jessica Cagle is our media director and assistant director of middle school youth. Uh, Earlier this week, she offered an Instagram post when she said, and in it, she invited us to be digital disciples. I love that description, digital disciples. Social media is another place where you can influence and be an example for the way of Jesus Christ, or you can follow the ways of this world, respond and react and share with the ways of this world. This past November, we shared a message that acknowledged our nation was about to enter a year of political divisiveness, that we were a year away from electing a president and other uh, officials of our land, and it would be the, the political divisiveness would ramp up. We put those, these three scripture passages on a card and we handed it out at that time to, to as many people as we could. We even did so again at Christmas. And, and we invited people to put that with their Bible, their devotional materials, to, to refer to that regularly and to try to live this year by those verses. The story from Jesus today seems to be a good time to be reminded of those verses because they can help us walk away from the temptation to respond to hurt with hurt, the temptation to respond to anger with anger, the temptation to respond to violence with violence. So we've now put those verses on a document that will be linked to this worship service on our website and on our church app. So I invite you to go there, find that link, and put it on your phone, your computer. Uh, Put it somewhere where you can have quick access to it, and you can use that on a regular basis and maybe share that with others. Let me read those verses again quickly, if I may. From Ephesians chapter 4 at verse 29 and following. Do not let any unwholesome talk come out of your mouths. And I'm convinced the writer today would say, or any unwholesome post be on your side. But only what is helpful for building others up according to their needs, that it may benefit those who listen. And do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God with whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. And then he tells us what that would look like. Get rid of all bitterness rage and anger, brawling and slander, along with every form of malice. Be kind and compassionate to one another, forgiving each other, just as in Christ God forgave you. And then from James chapter 1 at verse 19, brothers and sisters, take note of this. Everyone should be quick to listen, 
slow to speak and slow to become angry because human anger does not produce the righteousness that God desires. Finally, from Matthew chapter 7 at verse 12, Jesus said, do to others what you would have them do to you. Notice it does not say, do to others what they do to you or respond in kind to what others say to you. No, it's do to others what you would want them to do to you. And in this day and time, certainly we have opportunities every day to look for how can we do for others what we would want them to do for us. I don't know about you, but I'm amazed that Jesus walked away when he heard about what happened to his family member, John. But I shouldn't be. It's what he taught and what he lived. It's about a, a spiritual strength, a spiritual control, a spiritual power. And it comes from a close relationship with God, the one who gives this spiritual power. I invite you this morning to receive this gift of this relationship with this God that comes through Jesus Christ. Believe in him and let him teach you to grow spiritually. Yes, there are times to take a stand. There are times to, to stand up and, and say what you believe in and do what you believe is right. But there are also times when you and I need to walk away. We need to not respond or to react as this world teaches us to respond and react. Learn from Jesus. Let him teach you when to stand and when to walk away. Amen and amen. Let's pray. Gracious God, we give you thanks for this reminder today of what it looks like to be your people. And we admit, we confess that it, it is so tempting, it is so easy when we're hurt or we, when we see something that we disagree with, when we're angry, somebody makes us angry, we, we tend to, we're so tempted to respond in kind, to give back to them what they've given to us, what they've said, what they've done. Forgive us, Lord. Teach us. Change us. Recreate us that we might truly be your people in our relationships, that we might set an example and have an impact on those around us and what it means to be the people of Christ, to walk where he walked, and even at times to walk away. In Jesus' name, amen. Just your attendance at this point, if you would, uh, go to the church app. Down at the bottom on the, one of the keys that says get connected, click that, and right at the top you can register your attendance. We come now to the time to give our offering. We got word this week that our 36 children in Uganda coming from South Sudan, half of them are in boarding school. Actually, all of them are in boarding schools, and half of them can stay. But because the coronavirus is hitting Uganda now, half of them have been sent home or will be sent home to the camp. While they're there and while they're in school, we continue to support them with school fees and clothing and food. In Haiti, there are 300 children in two schools that we're providing lunch for every day. We reach out to so many places, not just in other countries, but in ours and in our city to serve. And we do that because you're good stewards. And so I invite you now at this point, if you give online, go ahead and do that. If not, just reach for your checkbook. Write that check, and so you can drop it in the mail tomorrow as we hear this reflective song. My tower of strength, my poor 
I have to admit that the last couple of days I've been questioning the Lord about whether this message that I believe he had given me was the, was the right message for right now. And it was as if the Lord showed me and reminded me, just in my own life as well as life out there in the world, that in times like this, in times when we're facing some difficulties, some strains on our schedules and our ways and on our systems that we can be so very tempted to turn on each other. We can be so very tempted to start to blame each other and look for places to place blame. I pray today that we as God's people won't be that way, that we can set a different example for others. I, I pray as, as we close this service today that you would let this be a time of reflection and introspection in your own life and in your own relationships and how you and I tend to respond and react to others. May we learn from Jesus. May we grow spiritually. Use this time, use these days to draw closer to our Lord so that as we relate to others, no matter how it is in coming days and weeks, we do so as he would have us to. Let him teach you when to take a stand and when to walk away. Amen.
生活。